the century, ravaged by violence, a society of perfect order will arise. Aggression and deviant behavior will be totally eliminated. But in the year 2032, two mortal enemies just dropped in to say hi from another time will be unleashed on a future that isn't big enough for the both of them. Demolition Man. Some of you viewers on this channel have been pretty vocal about wanting to see me do more of these movie retrospectives. That's something I want to focus big on this year, and here we are. We're stuck at home. There's a global viral pandemic. What would be a good movie to cover right now? Wesley Snipes was released from prison. There was no toilet paper. People avoid coming into physical contact with each other. Proceed with extreme assertiveness. Doctor's vehicle has been code fixed. Approaching the corner of Wilshire. Oh my God. Demolition Man. Seriously, this movie predicted everything. One of the classic Stallone movies from the 90s. It even includes these booths where you can make a call to someone and they make you feel better about yourself. I don't know. Lately, I just don't feel like there's anything special about me. You are an incredibly sensitive man who inspires joy-joy feelings in all those around you. Uh, uh. Oh, get out of here. Greetings, citizen. How are you feeling on this glorious day? You look great today. <laughs> I know there's a joke in there I could make about that better help scandal that some YouTubers were involved in not that long ago, but I just can't think of one right now, so insert better help scandal joke here. If none of this makes any sense to you, it will make sense to you by the end of this video, I promise. Demolition Man is one of those action movies that I remember most fondly for starting off like a really cool typical action movie and then going off the rails into just silliness. It's awesome. It was released at the tail end of 1993 when I was only seven years old. Most of the time when Stallone or Schwarzenegger had a movie come out, at the time, it was always a big deal. There would be merchandise, there would be cross promotions all over the place. Demolition Man was no different. An R-rated movie with violence, sexual jokes, and curse words. Where are the passengers? Ah, uh, yes, the passengers. Fuck you! He's finally matched his meat. You really licked his ass. That's met his match and kicked, kicked his ass. So it is a very adult film, and you bet your ass there were children's toys as well. In the future, you have to defrost a cop to put a criminal on ice. Sylvester Stallone is John Spartan, the demolition man. The toughest cop in the 21st century. <laughs> but Wesley Snipes is cold-blooded Simon Phoenix. Simon says free! <laughs> Now fry like a chicken, chicken. But Demolition Man always keeps his cool. Hey, you didn't say Simon Says. The future isn't big enough for the both of them. Demolition Man figures a bowler jet each sold separately, new from Mattel. But not only toys. We also had video games on multiple consoles. Let's not forget, this was the 90s where you could come out with an R-rated movie and market it to children. A magical time. You had a Super Nintendo version, you had the Sega Genesis version, which of course was very similar, except with that Sega Genesis sound. You also had a Sega CD version that was also similar, but it had that awesome CD quality sound, and that dreadfully compressed FMV footage of the movie that a lot of movie-based Sega CD games tried to do, and it looked terrible, even back then. And a 3DO game, which I have never played because I never owned a 3DO. I didn't know any kids that owned a 3DO. I don't even think I ever saw one with my own eyes as a child. This one had a live action Stallone superimposed into the game's graphics. And it played like a rail shooter. And it also had some fighting game style segments. This looks cool. I totally would have played this. Even DC Comics got in on the mix making a four issue limited series adapting the events of the movie in comic book form. At its core, Demolition Man's a story about a super cop named John Spartan that's obsessed with taking down the most dangerous criminal in all of Los Angeles, Simon Phoenix. Where are the hostages? To hell with the hostages! This is between you and me. Yeah. What? What? What you got, soldier boy? Do something. By the way, I love how all these action movie characters never have realistic names. It's always something super cool. John Spartan, 
Simon Phoenix, even let's go back to Commando, John Matrix, but you never have these action heroes with regular ass names like Ryan Smith is hunting down the world's worst criminal, Carl Jones. And it's also the far off future of 1996 Los Angeles. Crime has overtaken the city very much like the Los Angeles Predator 2. Everything's in chaos, they don't even land planes in the city anymore. John Spartan, played by the great Sylvester Stallone, is a no-nonsense legendary cop that takes criminals down hard. But he does have a reputation of causing tons of collateral damage to the point where his superiors call him the Demolition Man, hence the name of the movie. For good reason, I guess. He seems to run away from explosions quite often while yelling. Right at the beginning of the movie, the action gets going. The cops track Simon Phoenix down to a warehouse, and he's taken a bunch of hostages, and he's hid them somewhere. And of course, instead of going in with a SWAT team in stealth mode, quietly subduing the criminal, John Spartan by himself jumps from a helicopter screaming Phoenix's name all the way down. Send a maniac to catch him. I know this is very childish and immature, but I think it's hilarious. Every time I watch this scene, it sounds to me like he's screaming penis all the way down. Once you hear it once, you can never unhear it. When he finds Simon Phoenix, a fight ensues, and he's the polar opposite of John Spartan. You can really tell that Wesley Snipes had a blast with the role. He's this villain with no real motivation to be a villain, besides he likes to be bad. Sometimes those make the best villains, you don't need a whole deep backstory on them. He looks awesome with his bright, very 90s colored jacket and Beetlejuice pants. Where are they, Phoenix? Where did I put them? <laughs> I swear. I'd lose my head if it wasn't attached. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. The two duke it out, Phoenix is arrested, the whole thing was a setup. Barton didn't detect any of the hostages inside, but the cops found all the bodies. Much to Phoenix's joy, Spartan gets blamed for their deaths due to his brash nature. See that captain? I told him, he said he didn't care. Oh my god, how could you sacrifice all those innocent people? The little old man came up. Turn man on! We've been a lot of quality time together. See ya, sweetie. Honey, sugar. You got a lawyer, you better call. All of that happens at the beginning of the movie, and then it just turns into a completely different movie. Phoenix gets taken away, and Spartan gets charged for causing the deaths of the hostages. Apparently in this future world of 1996, if you're convicted of a severe crime, you don't go to prison. You get cryogenically frozen in what looks like that mineral oil that you take when you're constipated and you can't take a shit. They freeze you, and they stick these little devices on your head that subconsciously start programming your behavior to make you the perfect citizen while the years pass. This is where the movie really starts. We're jettisoned further into the future, the year 2032. And let me tell you guys, as of the time of this recording today, it is 2020. We are in for a wild ride for the next 12 years as we reach that 2032 time period. In this movie's version of history, there was this huge earthquake in the year 2010. The big one. Los Angeles was destroyed, it was rebuilt as San Angeles. A man named Dr. Raymond Cocteau, no I did not make the name up, that's his name in the movie, Dr. Cocteau rose up and created his vision of the perfect society so the world of the future is run with his ideals. He got rid of most crime, a million harmless things are outlawed. Oh, and he's also got this exaggeratingly flamboyant associate named Bob played by Glenn Shadix. If you recognize him, you've probably seen Beetlejuice. He plays the character just as exaggerated. In Demolition Man, he's got a goofy hairstyle and he's always wearing a kimono. Be well. Be fucked. Gunsman, you are fine. One. Oh. 
cars in the future are miraculously able to drive themselves and have television-like screens inside set at an extremely high 480p resolution, maybe even 360p. Technology so advanced that I could never imagine it existing today. Freedom of expression has been outlawed in the future also, it's all very ridiculous. One of the funniest things about this movie is how soft the police have become. With no real crime around, the police haven't really been trained to handle real criminals, so something like graffiti is a huge deal to them. Let me guess, Hall is serene. On the contrary, it's been a horrific AM. There was a defacement of public buildings, walls smudged with scandalous graffiti. Really? Brutal! Why wasn't there an all cars notified? And in this future, Dr. Cocteau created a rebel group led by a man named Edgar Friendly. I didn't make that name up either. Chose to live in the sewers underground, their own way, away from all the rules and all the oppression of the surface. I'm the kind of guy who likes to sit in a greasy spoon and wonder, gee, should I have the T-bone steak or the jumbo rack of barbecue ribs with the side order of gravy fries? I want high cholesterol. I want to eat bacon and butter and buckets of cheese, okay? I want to smoke a Cuban cigar the size of Cincinnati in a non-smoking section. I want to run through the streets naked with green jello all over my body reading Playboy magazine. Why? Because I suddenly might feel the need to, okay, pal? I've seen the future. You know what it is? It's a 47-year-old virgin sitting around in his beige pajamas drinking a banana broccoli shake singing, I'm an Oscar Mayer wiener. Dr. Cocteau sees him as a threat and secretly programmed the frozen Simon Phoenix with knowledge of future technology and an even deadlier set of skills. He wants to wake him up and have him kill Edgar Friendly. In the year 2032, it was time to release him and unleash him on the world. Retina coding accepted, Warden William Smithers. Be well. Yeah, you too. Simon Phoenix is a man that does not care that he has been frozen for decades. At the end of the day, he's just thrilled that he has all this knowledge and he has no idea how he knows the things he does. He's having the time of his life. Cops surround him and of course they don't have anywhere near the skills or gear to take down a man like Simon Phoenix. He just, I have no better way to put it. He Wesley snipes them. Angeles Information Network, Automated Banking, City of San Angeles. Damn, I'm possessed. I wonder if I can play the accordion too. <laughs> Simon Phoenix, lie down with your hands behind your back. <laughs> Police officers. We're not trained to handle this kind of violence. One of the cops in the SAPD is Sandra Bullock as Lieutenant Huxley. She's the one cop on the force that finds the 20th century exciting. She's got all these collectibles from the 90s, and she's got this innocence to her that results in hilarious moments. Since cursing is also outlawed in the future, she doesn't really understand certain sayings. So she's always trying to use phrases, but they're always used in the completely wrong way. Let's go blow this guy. Blow this guy away. <laughs> I understand this is a Stallone film and I've barely mentioned him. Where does he come into play? Well, it's the year 2032, an insanely dangerous criminal is on the loose, and you have quite a terrible police force. What do you do? You bring back his arch nemesis, the man that put him there, John Spartan. Spartan is a legend. I've been doing a historical study for 1,000 arrests over three years. All authentic criminals. How can you justify destroying a seven million dollar mini mall to rescue a girl whose ransom is only twenty five thousand dollars? Fuck you, lady. Good answer. They decide to unfreeze him, and this is where all the shenanigans ensue. Mind you, this is not a serious movie at all. It is quite goofy at times. This man is frozen in time. He comes out. His wife died in an earthquake in 2010. He's got a daughter somewhere that doesn't really know him. And he's avoiding seeing her because he's afraid of what she'll think of him. It sounds tragic and all. But the real tragedy is that the criminal was programmed with all these Captain America super skills. And while John Spartan was frozen, he was programmed with 
It's so stupid. I'll just show you. Behavioral engineering? Here, I made this for you. For me? Yeah. Thank you. Look, I don't know what you guys put into my cryo slush, but when I thought out, the first thing I wanted to do was knit. I can weave a throw rug right now with my eyes closed. For each inmate, the computer draws up a skill or trade which best suits their genetic disposition. And it would implant the knowledge and the desire to carry out whatever training was assigned. I'm a seamstress? Oh, that's just great. His worst enemy was programmed to be a super soldier, and he has the ability to knit sweaters. How could you not love this movie? I come out of cryo prison and I'm Betsy fucking Ross. If Phoenix comes out and he can access computers, operate all vehicles, knows the location of every damn thing in town, and is three times stronger than when he went in. Most of the movie is actually him just trying to adjust to the future, and it's complete shell shock for him. It's full of ridiculousness. It's well known that Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger have a friendly rivalry off screen, and they went all in in the late 80s, early 90s. So it's always entertaining watching these two actors throw digs at each other on social media and in their movies. And then Schwarzenegger, I, I, I've read that you guys actually hated each other for a while. Well, we were very competitive. Yeah, I think hate's a good word. Well, I hate this guy. I'm going to blow him away next yeah. audition. No. Hey, let's share a blanket this weekend at the beach. No. I don't think that so. Didn't you can, no, I really respect this guy, but I want to strangle him. You want to strangle him? <laughs> I did. Well, I mean, yeah. But I mean, you, you would do Rambo, and then he would do... Commando. Commando, yeah. <laughs> it just kept going. I've been keeping up with all the little jabs they throw at each other over the years, and it made one of the scenes in this movie way more rewarding. I've been an enthusiast of your escapades for quite some time now. I have, in fact, perused some newsreels from the Schwarzenegger Library, and that time that you took that car... Hold it. The Schwarzenegger Library? Yes, the Schwarzenegger Presidential Library. Wasn't he an actor when Stop. you... Stop, he was president? Yes. Even though he was not born in this country, his popularity at the time caused the 61st Amendment, which states that... I he don't want to know. But what really blows my mind is that almost exactly 10 years later, Arnold Schwarzenegger actually became the governor of California. I get it, it's not the president, and technically he can't be president because he wasn't born in the United States, but shortly after he was elected, there was an amendment proposed called the Equal Opportunity Amendment. Now this would allow anyone that was a legal US citizen for at least 20 years to run for president. It never passed, but it was widely seen as an attempt to let Arnold run for president. So it was actually nicknamed the Arnold Amendment. Wasn't he an actor when Stop. you- Stop, he was president? Yes. I want to strangle him, you want to strangle him? <laughs> <laughs> and you see what I mean about Demolition Man coming very close to predicting the actual future? Had that passed, Arnold Schwarzenegger may have been president. The world of the future is completely foreign to John Spartan, to say the least. He's forced to enlist back with the police force to capture Simon Phoenix, and the law is really all he has left. But he's almost alien to other police officers, the way he conducts himself, the way he talks. His only real connection to the past is one guy that he knew from before he was frozen that happens to be an old man now and still working there. Shit. You're a damn good fly. You are fined two credits for a violation of the verbal morality statute. I'll be right back. They seem to be friends, yet he speaks to him in the most profane manner. Well, if you had read my study, you would know that this is how insecure heterosexual males used to bond. And the chief of police absolutely hates him. What do you think you're scratching, caveman? You really think we'd let you go without control? Your code was implanted the second you thought. Why didn't you just shove a leash up my ass? Media. I cannot digest how you ever wore a badge. You're going back, John Spartan. Oh, yes, you're going back. We need every cortex we can get in this situation. We don't need the Neanderthal. He's going for a gun. Who cares what this primate thinks? And he also discovers that you can't use foul language. That is not a world I would ever want to live in. If you do, an alarm goes off and you get fined every single time. This device was widely utilized in the urban wars of the late 20th century. Referred to as a pistol. Where the goddamn guns? You are fined one credit for a violation of the verbal morality statute. What? Fuck you! It has been deemed that anything not good for you is bad, hence illegal. Alcohol, caffeine, contact sports, meat. Are you shitting me? John Spartan, you are fined one credit for a violation of the verbal morality statute. What the hell is that? 
John Spartan, you are fined one grip. Look, I hate to interrupt you two lovebirds, but that's really fucking stupid. Do you Spartan, think he wants to start a business? Thanks a lot, you shit. John Spartan, you are fined John Spartan, you are But there are two things in the Demolition Man universe that are infamous. Toilet paper, Taco Bell. I don't even know where to start with this. Okay, so John Spartan, I assume, takes a huge shit, and he comes back confused as ever because he can't find the toilet paper. Look, I don't know if you guys know it, but you're, uh, you're out of toilet paper. They used handfuls of wadded paper back in the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that you're happy, but the place where you're supposed to have the toilet paper... You got this little shelf with three seashells on it. <laughs> he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs> In the future, there's no toilet paper. People use three seashells to clean up or something. The movie doesn't explain it in any way, shape, or form. And it has been the subject of hot debates over the years. Some people think they know the answers. Some people think it's been clearly explained. But to find these answers, we have to go to the real experts, the people in the actual movie. Rob Schneider, yes, he's the young police officer in the movie, thinks that the toilet paper exists under the seashells. Spartan just failed to lift them up and look underneath. Well, three seashells is a type of toilet paper. So there you go. Everybody knows. He doesn't know how to use the three seashells. You use the three seashells, you open it up, and the toilet paper comes down. How do you use the three seashells? We gotta lift them up, asshole. It's right underneath there. Sandra Bullock seems to think that each shell represents a part of the cleanup process, which I think makes the most sense. What's, yes. Can you explain the seashells to me finally? I don't get the seashell thing. Well, think of a bidet, right? There's several processes. You have number one, number two, and then you have the cleanup. And I didn't make... <laughs> Every time I look at this picture. And I didn't make this... <laughs> I can't. I can't look at this picture without laughing. I didn't make this diagram. I found it on the internet, but I think it best illustrates how these seashells possibly work. First, you take seashell number one and number two. You place them together, and then, preferably while standing up, you let the turd slowly come out of your butthole, and you use seashell number one and two as collection tools. You just kind of let it fall in and scoop it up. Then you take seashell number three, you scrape off any dingleberries and clean any fecal remains, and then you dispose of the seashells. But we still have one expert left, John Spartan himself. Let's see what Stallone says. How did the three seashells work in Demolition Man? Well, without getting too gross, imagine how chopsticks work and Use your imagination from there. So there you have your explanations. Pick the theory you like best, or better yet, just go collect three seashells along your local beach, go into the bathroom and try to use them on your ass in some manner, and then report back to me in the comment section how it worked for you. YouTube is a wild place. At least one person's gonna tell me in the comments that they seriously tried that. I might too, it's possible. And I'd also like to mention that the world of the future not only uses these seashells as ass cleaning tools, the radio doesn't even play music anymore. All they play are commercials. Imagine watching YouTube, but there's literally no content anymore. It's 100% ads. That's the radio of the future. The number one request of the day, Armor Hot Dogs. Kids eat Armor Hot Dogs. Oh, wow, this is my fave. Kids, kids, kids who climb on rocks. Somebody put me back in the fridge. Now let's go ahead and discuss Taco Bell. This is where the movie gets truly amazing. In the future, every single restaurant is a Taco Bell. Unless you're watching the European version of the film where all restaurants are Pizza Huts. Since Taco Bell actually wasn't a big thing over there, so they changed it all to Pizza Hut. The true version of the movie is Taco Bell. Every restaurant being a Taco Bell. I don't think I would hate that. You can't talk about Taco Bell and not want Taco Bell. I'm sorry. Mmm. It's like food porn. A couple soft tacos and a Baja Blast. This is free promotion, Taco Bell. 
In the meantime, while I eat, let's go to a quick commercial break from our sponsor, my Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel and allow me to continue making videos like this for all eternity, you can become a patron for as little as the cost of a soft taco a month. Never required, but always appreciated. Link in the video description below, or you can head on over to patreon.com slash gamerthumbtv. And while we're on the topic, I'd like to go ahead and give a quick thank you to my current patrons supporting the channel and my current channel members. You are all beautiful people. Thank you, guys. All right, so we've established that all restaurants are Taco Bells in the movie. How the hell did that happen? Well, at some point between the year 2010 and 2032, there were the Franchise Wars, where all the major food corporations had some kind of conflict. Whether it was military or some kind of corporate takeover, I, I don't know. The movie doesn't explain it, much like the seashells. Taco Bell won the war, and it took over everything. And my god did Taco Bell take advantage of this marketing. At San Diego Comic Con in 2018, Taco Bell actually recreated a Taco Bell location of the future inspired by the movie Demolition Man. An actual restaurant that you could go to and eat. I'm so pissed off I didn't know about this beforehand. I totally would have gone over there. And now I can never experience the Taco Bell of Demolition Man. Maybe one day in the future. That is amazing. And for those that wanted more story details on the franchise wars, there does exist a prequel to Demolition Man that takes place during the franchise wars. A promotion made by Taco Bell called Web of Fries 2. I did not make that up either. Look. Big Fries took everything from me to keep my father from exposing the truth about Nacho Fries. The ads are everywhere. Flip the switch. Their fight is about protecting their business. My fight is personal. Rebellion is forming. The small potatoes, Jim. Is there anything that tastes better than this? Revenge. If I did their way long enough, it ends today. This is no longer just a song and ketchup world. The future is not your fault. I'm back! For a limited time! I'm trying to think if there's any more craziness from the future in this movie that I didn't talk about yet. I almost forgot to talk about the sex. In the future, people don't have sex anymore. The transfer of bodily fluids is seen as dirty and infectious. It's outlawed. It's illegal. People go to labs to have kids. John Spartan gets all excited because Huxley asks him, Hey, do you want to have sex? And he's like, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, why would you say no? But future sex is all done via virtual reality. Um, I was wondering if you would like to have sex. Oh, yeah. Great! <laughs> now just relax. I'll begin in a few seconds. Begin what? He broke contact. Con contact? I didn't even touch you yet. But I, I thought you wanted to make love. Is that what you call this? I actually can't believe that I have to bring this movie up again. Movie. But here we go. This reminds me of the Star Wars Holiday Special. I hate that movie. If you want to watch my review on it, click the link right up there and you can check out my review. There's a scene in that movie that's right out of Demolition Man. Chewie's dad, who's called Atichitchuk? At Shitcuck? Uh, at Shitcuck. That's his name. At Shitcuck. I don't know. He also uses a VR helmet for his own devious pleasures. It's one of the most bizarre freaking things I've ever witnessed in anything. With Simon Phoenix on the loose and the future so wild, Spartan doesn't have a lot to work with and the police have no idea where Phoenix is. But his old school cop skills tell him that Phoenix is going to be looking for a gun. Well, in this future, the only guns are in museums and the museum is an entire hall of violence that holds relics of previous wars. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Oh, motherfucker! You want my... Fucking hell. You want my... Hello, greetings. 
How much do you weigh? Well, I happen to weigh for this. I love how Phoenix gets these weapons from the museum and all these guns on display happen to be fully loaded, ready for anyone that gets their hands on them to use. And this fight between Spartan and Phoenix is insane. Phoenix, he's just firing away with his weapons. Spartan gets some weapons and fires away too. Phoenix even has this futuristic gun. And then Spartan swings a CRT TV at him with the cord. <laughs> Do you know how heavy those old TVs were? You cannot grab one by the cord and swing it like a mace. Unfortunately, Simon Phoenix escapes and he encounters Dr. Cocteau and threatens to shoot him, but of course, since he was mentally influenced by the man, he doesn't shoot him. So Spartan realizes that something is up between them and he tracks Phoenix down to the underground where he's hiding. At this point, he's gathered his own little gang with other prisoners that were also frozen. And let me go ahead and say that I love his future uniform. It's just all made out of tires and rubber. And the underground actually isn't so bad. All these people are just living like people used to live. They have beer that they could drink. They're cooking burgers. Compared to what's above, this is awesome, except for the fact that the burgers are made out of rats. Huxley, what's that supposed to mean? Do you see any cows around here, Detective? Que es esta carne? Esta carne es de rata. Rat. This is a rat burger. Not bad. Down in the underground, they also meet Edgar Friendly, realizing that he's not such a bad guy. He just wants to live free. And do you notice who's standing there next to him? I had to look this up to confirm it, but there is a young Jack Black. When he first started out as an extra, I've seen this movie a million times and I never realized that Jack Black was standing right there. He's got no lines, he's got no other real scenes, but there he is. And then Phoenix shows up and attacks all of them, which I find hilarious because he just pops up after he tells his gang that he's going to go after them. Was he right next door the whole time and he just kind of turned the corner and he was there? I'll be goddamn like a New York cockroach! By this time, we're nearing what the rest of the movie pretty much is. Just a chase between Spartan and Phoenix. They do battle, they beat on each other. Phoenix admits that the original hostages that got Spartan arrested were already dead, so he's even more of a dick than he was before. And I almost forgot to mention some more future technology here. Cars don't have airbags anymore. They have some kind of special foam that just fills up your car, and I guess it hardens and keeps you safe inside like a shell or something. had been prematurely terminated. Yeah, I thought I was just you too. What the hell happened all of a sudden? This car turned into a cannoli. And I never understood why he calls the car a Mickey Mouse piece of shit. I never understood that. Why does he say that? Maybe it's because the car's black and white that just hit me. I, that could be why. By the end of the movie, Phoenix has completely gotten out of control. He kills Cocteau, because obviously a criminal of his caliber can't be kept on a leash or controlled. And he takes over the cryogenics facility and sets a timer to release 80 of the worst criminals, including Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, the real-life serial killer? Oh, let's see. Wilkes, Patrick. Jeffrey Dahmer? I love this guy! 
Barton, like any awesome action hero, gets in his original ass-kicking uniform from before he was frozen, and he goes after him and his cronies before he can get a chance to revive all the criminals. And when it starts to become a badass action movie again with a really cool final battle, it gets absurd again. The Spartan gets trapped in a Toy Story claw machine. It's hilarious. And Phoenix is just berating him. Again, Wesley Snipes must have had a blast playing his character. <laughs> When he finally defeats Simon Phoenix, I feel like it was one of those victories that happened because the bad guy did something stupid. He looks down in shock and gives Spartan plenty of time to react and freeze him. Typical villain that gives the hero too much opportunity to react to something. And it's great that this end is so violent since the rest of the movie has been kind of goofy, resulting in children's toys and video games. And like that, John Spartan finally defeated Simon Phoenix and saved the future. Interesting to note that in the comic book, he finally gets a chance to meet his daughter. None of that actually happens in the movie. In the movie, he just kisses Huxley and they go off into the night together while the movie starts playing credits music that says demolition over and over in a very festive manner. This movie is so absurd, you can't watch it and not love it. You just can't. It has left a legacy that is still remembered to this day. Yeah, probably mostly because of the toilet paper and Taco Bell, but the movie offers so much more ridiculousness. And just recently, Stallone has confirmed that a Demolition 2 is in the works. This man just casually talked about it on his Instagram. No big news, he just casually dropped that fact and moved on to another Q&A. Can we get another demo, man? I think there is coming. There, we're working on it right now with uh, Warner Brothers. I mean, it's looking fantastic. So that should come out. That's going to happen. If you want to check this movie out, head over to my Amazon link in the description and pick it up for yourself. Helps the channel out, and I paid like six bucks for it on Blu-ray with free Prime shipping. There's also a Stallone triple feature available that includes the over-the-top movie, which I'm pissed because I found out about this later, so if I buy this, I'm going to own two copies of Demolition Man. And let me know in the comment section below if you want to see more retro reviews like this. I used to do a lot more of them. I want to get back into the, the flow and do much more of them. Let me know if you want me to cover the Demolition Man games. I actually haven't played them myself, but I wouldn't mind trying them out after watching this movie on repeat for the last week. That's all I got for you today. I'll catch you guys later. Since you made it to the end of this video, I assume you enjoyed it, so why don't you go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any new content. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Links in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can join my Patreon or become a channel member. This is Fabian. I love you guys, and I'll see you next time.